This is my first partner conversation. Your forgiveness in advance is appreciated. <laughs> but uh, the, the reason I'm here is because I met Leif um, at the Oriental Theater in, must have been 2018. And Leif was here for um, Virgil Wander. And, um, and I had met, well, and so I begged Daniel to let me do this because he knows how important Virgil Wander is to me. Um, you know, six years later, I still say Virgil Wander is in my top five books ever. Oh, um, well, nice. And, um, and I have been quoted as saying that, um, that your books prove a reverential and brilliant awareness of humanity. And I am not backing down from that because <laughs> um, in every book I stop dozens of times and say, exactly, you have nailed down what it takes and what it means to be human. But that You're night- my favorite kind of reader. <laughs> you know, I mean, by the way, thank you so much for being here. We're sincerely grateful. One more hand for, for life, please. And, and that night I had, you know, I had read Virgil Wander and, and one of my reviews lately said, I met you and I felt like I already knew you. The writing matched the man. You know, there was this um, clear intelligence, but this sort of warm wisdom and um, humility and gratitude and a little sly humor. But then for this, I confess I hadn't read anything else by you. <laughs> I went back, I read Peace Like a River. And of course, now I've read I'd Cheerfully Refuse. And what I didn't know about you is there's this kind of wicked twist to you. <laughs> you know, the adventure gets tough. Um, the world's not easy and you take it head on. So my first question for you is if indeed the writing matches the man, who are you, Leifeng? <laughs> Can you tell us, people that know you well, what would they say, how would they describe you? And are there any like illuminating stories you could give? Oh, uh, wow, that's a that's a really tough. I, okay, so you brought up um, that you had read that, that my mom read uh, Robert Louis Stevenson to us kids when I was, um, I was the youngest of four. So I was young enough that when she read Treasure Island to us, um, I thought that there was a character in there who could only say one thing, pieces of eight. Well, it was Captain Flint, who is a parrot. And and that's all that Captain Flint does say is pieces of eight. And I, I just thought, why is there this one guy who who can only say one phrase? And what does the phrase mean? So I was three or four, I suppose, and I didn't get it at all. Uh, but then she kept reading that book to us aloud until I was a bit older um, and repeated readings are a, are a tremendous thing. But um, maybe maybe the wickedness is because I loved uh, I loved John Silver. I loved Long John uh, more than I loved anybody else in the story. Even Jim, who is just this fabulous hero of the story and is and is telling it even more than uh, you know some of the really likable or lovable characters, I loved Long John and he was a terrible guy. I mean, do you remember that story? He's just a, he's like a politician. He plays both sides and he's, um, he just, you know, he, he kills a guy by throwing a crutch at him. I mean, he's a terrible person. And, and then later when, when it suits him, he switches sides again. And, uh, and yet I was just, I was in love with him as a character and, and I still am. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly what that says uh, about me, but something for sure. Yeah. I guess maybe what it says is that, um, is that I really approach all my people knowing that they have the capability to, to go either way. And that for them, um, as for me, many things can be true at one time. We're complicated people. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, I mean, I, I love reading acknowledgments here um, and your acknowledgments and peace like a river are, are great. You know, your father and mother born in North Dakota, right. um, 
dad believes in a strenuous life and in vivid narration. Um, so For the, sure. ang the anger childhood was adventurous, I take it. Well, I mean, it, it didn't seem uh, unusually so at the time, no. But I mean, we we went uh, we went back to we were a westward pointing family, and so we um, we went to North Dakota in the fall for goose hunting and to visit grandparents. and And um, and Dad was a guy who liked to put his hands on things and liked to shoot geese out of the sky and and um, and and he had very specific ideas about action and manhood and. And so, uh, and so I, I grew up that way also as the youngest of four and, and sort of, uh, you know, always the smallest and the weakest and, 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 and maybe the most bookish, I was doomed to disappoint him in lots of ways. Um, but, um, you, you aspire to things that you can't always pull off. So I wasn't always, uh, one for the strenuous life. And then I went off and became an English major, which isn't that strenuous, um and and a public radio reporter which which makes you infuriatingly reasonable um and and then and then an author which which dad thought was all right um but you know nothing to write home about yeah all right so the it, ly lyrical parents because the the brothers lee yeah and lynn yeah the sister elizabeth Yes. And and Leif. Yeah. Um, but I was taken with Lynn was your most gentle and persistent writing teacher. Absolutely. And taught you more about your brother. Yes. And taught you more about the craft of writing than anyone else. For sure. I mean, um, most of you don't know this. My brother Lynn and I used to write mystery novels. Um, we wrote novels for pocket books um, in the early 90s. And we wrote a series. Uh, about a um, a former Major League Baseball player who had resigned in disgrace and moved to the north woods of Minnesota and bought 400 acres and lived in the middle of it where no one could touch him. Uh, this was utterly wish fulfillment on our part. Uh, what we both wanted was to be big, strong, six foot six Major League ball players, um, you know, around whom women just grew weak in the knees. We just thought that would be great. And um, and neither one of us was that. Uh, but what happened there is I, I had just gotten a job doing uh, radio reporting for Minnesota Public Radio. I loved the job. Uh, my first chance to really work with stern editors. Uh, we're like, enough of your adjectives. Um, they were they were great. Um, but I got a letter, uh, snail mail from my brother Lynn who was down in Iowa at the Iowa Writers Workshop he was writing serious fiction um, which he had a gift for and and so he was down there with you know serious teachers and um, serious students I remember him saying one time you know who's going to be kind of a rock star is this girl Anne he was talking about Patchett um, uh, they were there at the same time and Lynn was like oh she's so good you're, you're going to see her name in lights and uh, boy, was he correct about that. Uh, but he wrote me a letter and said, listen, this is the golden age of the mystery novel. Uh, go read some Elmore Leonard, read some Robert B. Parker, read some um, uh, Sarah Paretsky, read some Lawrence Block. And and then once you've done that, let's let's write one together and, and get rich. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, we we gave it a shot. I, I went to the library and checked out all the Elmore Leonard they had and the rest of them too, and read them real fast. And, and you know, those are great books, great stories in which big things happen and, you know, people get killed and then justice comes. And uh, I, I still, I love mystery novels. And, um, and so we read a bunch of those and, and we said to each other, how hard can this be? Um, and, and so we wrote one and it was really hard. I mean, it was, it was incredibly difficult to do and to do well, it was so hard. Um, and after a couple of years, we finally sold one, uh, on a two book contract to pocket paperback originals. Um, and another guy that was publishing with pocket then was James Lee Burke. And, and we both, we, we read, um, the neon rain and, and, um, Lynn said, what do you think of this guy? I said, I I think he's way better than we're ever going to be. 
and um, and he was. And um, so we stayed with that. And here, here's what was so great about it for me. Uh, Lynn understood writing better. He was at the workshop. He understood what is going on under the hood. I was much more sort of intuitive and wrote by feel. Um, and that's that's still, I think, maybe the difference between us is I don't always understand what's going on. He generally does. Uh, we try to learn from each other um, as, as, as this goes on. But he was able to sort of set me straight. Um, I would send him pages in the mail. He would send me pages. I was writing chapters one through five while he was writing six through 10. Um, and this was before the internet. You, there was no email. We were sending these in 10 envelopes. Um, and he was the guy who could read my chapters and say, you know, it feels to me like you're reading Garcia Marquez while you're writing this. Because there's a sentence here that's half a page long and, and in which strange things are happening. And, and he was utterly right. I mean, I just, he said, just try to sound more like me and I'll try and, and I'll try to sound more like you except without the super long sentences. And, and we, we hit, uh, there was no, for me, there was no ego involved. There certainly wasn't ego involved for him because he was, he was teaching me the craft as we went along. Um, so yeah, my absolute favorite writing teacher that I've ever had, and I've had a couple of good ones. He was easily the best. Yeah, thanks for letting me talk about that. Yeah, oh, thank you. Um, I mean, it reminds me. Well, I, I, what I want to ask you is, I consider you to be really good. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, I'm not. I don't read fast. I haven't read everything, but I've read. You know, I read. Colson Whitehead. I've read a bunch of Pulitzer. You know, I've read Claire in the Sun. You know, I've read really good people. You're you're really good. You know, and um, thank you. I wonder how old you were when you first realized. You know, I think of sweet. I mean, I I as I'm sure with most people, I can't get sweet from Beast Like a River out of my head. Writing this epic Western poem. How old is she in the book? Nine or yeah, nine. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, how <laughs> how old were you when you were first saying, you know what? I actually think I can do this. I I'm good. Um, I, I I think that took a long time, but I did I did start early. Uh, when I was in third grade, I was eight years old, and I had a wonderful teacher. Oh man, she was so smart. She would read to us um, every day, and and then I guess I just wanted to write a poem um, and see what she thought of it because she clearly she would read us poetry. Uh, after recess to settle us down. And I thought that was really fun. And I loved the rhyming. I loved the rhythm. Um, -da -da -ba -da -da -ba. They were just, uh, I still, I still fall into it. And so I wrote a poem um, and just gave it to her. And she did the coolest thing. Um, she, she started a, 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 a project, a class-wide project. She got, bought a great big uh, blank scrapbook and anybody that wrote a poem in the class we, it was never an assignment she said anybody can do what life has done here and just write poetry and and if you bring it to me i'll type it up and i'll put it in this book and we'll we'll write a book of poetry as a class and i mean it was a brilliant idea and every kid in the class was just kind of lit up about it i mean uh it wasn't an elite project. It wasn't for just me or just whoever. Um, this was a split grade of third graders and fourth graders. And all those lovely kids wrote poetry. And some of it was, some of it was pretty good. Some of it was pretty bad. Um, all of it went into the book and we were all proud of it. I have that book in my closet because, uh, because Mrs. Johnson, who was our teacher, um, came to a, a reading of mine um, after Peace Like a River came out and she'd had the book all that years and she, all, all those years and she hung on to it. She gave it to me. So my best friend, Phil Helgen, who um, is, is still my best friend after all this time, he has a lot of poetry in there too. Uh, so we trade off every couple of years. I give it to him. He enjoys it for a while. He passes it back to me. Um, but I think at that point, I thought maybe there's something I can do with this. And then in, in 10th grade, I had another wonderful teacher, uh, English teacher, Karen Sinat, 
And she was one of those fabulous teachers, every kid needs one, who when they, when they understand that you really like to read, they've got like a, they've got a shelf that, that isn't out in the open. And they say, here's one I think you might like. And they hand off something that isn't on the curriculum. And she knew exactly what, it, that was my introduction to, um, to John Updike, a great short story called A&P about a, about a, a kid who takes a job bagging groceries. I had a job bagging groceries at that time. And so she knew I would dig it. And it was funny and cool and romantic. And, um, and, and it also has this bag boy quitting his job at the end because his boss has, um, has, has acted inappropriately toward um, a beautiful girl that, that this bag boy has kind of fallen for in the shop. And, and he quits, he throws down his apron and he walks out and there's, uh, I, I still remember the last line, which is, I don't remember it exactly, so I'll butcher it, but it has to do with, I began to realize how hard the world would be to me thereafter. And I thought, oh, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever encountered. And, and so I, I didn't imagine, um, I didn't imagine myself really doing it until Karen Sinat said, hey, there's a there's a novel writing contest for high school kids. I think you should write one. And, um, and I said, I, I, no, I'm, uh, I'm not. kids in high school don't write novels. And she said, um, she said, ever, ever hear of the outsiders ever hear of, of, uh, of Susan Hinton. Uh, and I had not. So she gave me that book and it knocked me out and I didn't write one. I didn't, I didn't write one. I, I tried and I gave up. Um, but after that, I thought somebody thinks I could write a book. Uh, me, a living person, maybe could write a book. And um, and so I think at that point, I I always hoped to Tim. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going um, on a long time on these questions. No, no, no this is great. <laughs> I, th this is what I wanted to know. I wanted to know you <laughs> more than just a, a Oriental theater. Um, so. I want to transition to cheerfully refuse, but I, I was a teacher myself and taught, you know, fifth graders for a long time. Favorite childhood books. Um, can you just name a few? Do you have any in mind? Things oh, that you just remember that you loved? Yeah. First, first book I ever just fell head over heels into was The Wind in the Willows. Oh. Um, Kenneth Graham's great book. And I remember um, just going to my room, having been sent there, and um, and picking it off the shelf. And suddenly, I just wasn't in my room anymore. There's that that opening scene where where the mole is is uh, doing his housekeeping, and he's underground, uh, like moles are in the spring, and and something is calling to him from up above, and and he burrows up and pokes his snout up into the warm sunshine, and and um, and man, that is just what that's just what a great book can do. And and then suddenly you're you're down at the river, and the water rat is there, and and the otter is is there, and you're having a picnic. Uh, I, I I I it's it's happening to me again right now. Um. And so yeah, I, that first, then probably after that, uh, the Narnia Chronicles, uh, the great stories about the land that you reach through the wardrobe. I love those two. Um, but honestly, I think that's what I'm always looking for is the next book that's going to make me forget where I am and, and who I am. Yeah, absolutely. Lovely. Um, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me on any of this, the night of uh, the Virgil, Virgil Wander at the Oriental Theater, you were talking about working on another book prior to Virgil Wander. And for some reason, the number th three years pops to mind. You were working on this book for three years and and didn't finish it. And someone in the audience asked, well, well what did you do with it? And you said, I threw it out. Because once I had Virgil, I didn't want it tarnishing or clouding my thoughts about Virgil's voice. Yeah. Um, so I just wondered, do things like that come back over time? Um, I'm going to get to it later, but I'm going to point out that the that cheerful refusal shows up in Virgil Wander. Adam Lear 
cheerfully refuses um, to Nadine's, you know, yeah. push away. Um, so <laughs> did that old book come back? Do they come back sometimes? I don't think that one, um, I don't think so. I mean, the truth is I don't remember that book very well. I mean, I, I spent three years on it and, and I threw it away because um, I, I had finished a draft. It was done. It was, it was 400 pages. And then I got real sick. I got meningitis and I was sick for a couple of months. My eyes didn't work right because it just, um, I just, I couldn't function physically. And, um, and then when I got better, I opened my laptop and read that script and something had changed. I mean, my, my perspective was different and I just saw it as a terrible book. It, it may not have been that bad. I, I, I couldn't tell you. It was basically, it was a similar story to Virgil it took place in Greenstone. There was an old theater. It wasn't owned by Virgil, but by another person and and there were sort of rotating uh, a rotating cast of points of view, and it just didn't seem good. I just thought, no, I've done a bad, I've I've written a bad book, um, and I didn't throw it away until I until I had a new voice to tell a similar story in. Uh, but then once I started it in Virgil's voice, uh, I guess I'm just made to write first person books because once Virgil started speaking to me, I I, I knew that it would be all right. Uh, so I, I, I wrote it again. Once I had a chapter, then I just hit delete on the other one because I just didn't want to mess around with it anymore. And, and also because I have the most patient wife in the world. And I thought if Robin doesn't object, I'm just, I'm going to throw this out. She said, no, do what you have to do because she's that cool. <laughs> uh, your husband says, I've just wasted three years of both our lives. And she says, okay. Um, that's rare. I think that's rare. Uh, but, but no, I, I, I suppose old things come back. Old ideas come back. Uh, I write all my ideas down in notebooks that I then never go back and read. Um, but I think maybe the act of writing them down does cement them somewhere in a little back alleyway of my head. And, uh, they, they probably ease their way back out at some point. Yeah. Thanks. So I cheerfully refuse. Um, can you do, I want to do a little reading and give us sort of the thumbnail sketch as sure. well? Sure, absolutely. All right, thank you. So this is a book that takes place a few decades into the future. Um, it is, it's being characterized as dystopian. Um, and I think that, I think that is sort of accurate uh, with a qualification. I feel like mis most dystopias are set in motion by, by something outside of our control, um, a pandemic or, um, or a, you know, biblical flood or, uh, whatever it might be, uh, asteroid strikes, you know, um, and this is this, this is dystopian, but it's the sort of dystopian we could maybe just sort of vote ourselves into, um, or, 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 you know, one day wake up and, and realize that 16 people own everything and all our friends are in work camps. Um, uh, and that the churches are run by warlords I mean, some things about this feel like the 30, 40 years out. Some of them feel 15 minutes out, depending on what it is. Uh, but I did not want to spend a lot of time belaboring exactly what happened. I just wanted to tell a story that happens out there at this, at this juncture in history. And the first, uh, the first chapter is called uh, First Do No Harm. Here at the beginning, it must be said, the end was on everyone's mind. For example, look at my friend Labrino who showed up one gusty spring night. It was moonless and cold, wind droning in the eaves, waves on Superior standing up high and ramming into the seawall. Lark and I lived two blocks off the water and you could feel those waves in the floorboards. Labrino had to bang on the door like a lunatic just to get my attention. 
Still, it was good he knocked at all. There were times Labrino was so melancholy he couldn't bring himself to raise his knuckles. And then he might stand motionless on the back step until one of us noticed he was there. It was unnerving enough in the daytime, but once it happened when I couldn't sleep and was prowling the kitchen for leftovers. Three in the morning, just when you want to see a slumping hairy silhouette right outside your house. When the shock wore off, I opened the door and told him not to do that anymore. But this time he knocked. Then came in, shaking off his coat and settled murmuring into the breakfast nook. I knew Labrino because he owned a tavern on the edge of town, the Lantern, where the band I was in played most weekends. He was lonely and kind and occasionally rude by accident. But above all things, he was a worried man. He said, now tell me what you'd make of this comet business. He meant the Tashi Comet, named for the Tibetan astronomer who spotted an anomaly in the deep space software. From its path so far, Mr. Tashi believed it would sweep past Earth in 13 months. He predicted dazzling beauty visible for weeks. A sun grazer, he called it, in an article headlined, The Celestial Event of Our Time. I admitted to Labrino I was awfully excited. In fact, I had driven down to the Greenstone Fair and picked up a heavy old set of German binoculars with a tripod mount. Didn't even haggle, but paid the asking price. I wanted to be ready. Labrino said, these comets never bring luck to a living soul. That's all I know. How could you know that? Besides, they don't have to bring luck. They just have to show up once in a while. Think where these comets have been. I've waited my whole life to see one. He said, you know what happened last time Halley's went past? It was before my day. Oh, I've read about this, said Labrino. Whenever things seemed especially fearsome to him, his great bushy head came forward and his eyes acquired a prophetic glint. 1986, a terrible year. Right out of the gate, that space shuttle blew up. Challenger took off from Florida. Big crowd, huge success for a minute or so. Then pow, that rocket turns to a trail of white smoke. Everybody in the world watching on TV. I told Labrino I was fairly sure Halley's Comet was not involved in the Challenger explosion. He said, you know what else happened? Russian nuclear meltdown. One day it's, look, there's the comet. Next day, Chernobyl turns to poison soup. Kills the workers sent to clean it up. Kills everything for a thousand miles. Rivers, wolves, house cats, earthworms to a depth of 19 inches. Swedish reindeer setting off the Geigers. I wouldn't be so anxious for this if I were you. I couldn't really blame Labrino. The world was so old and exhausted that many now saw it as a dying great-grand on a surgical table, body decaying from use and neglect, mind fading down to a glow. If Lark were here, she would prop him right up, and he wouldn't even know it was happening. But she was late getting home from the shop, and I, like a moron, felt annoyed and impatient, also weirdly protective of a traveling space rock. So I said, it still wasn't the comet's fault. I'm not claiming causation, said Labrino, his skin pinking. I'm saying there are signs and wonders. The minute these comets appear in the heavens, all kinds of calamities start chugging away on Earth. I opened my mouth, then remembered a few things about my friend. He had a grown son living in a tent on top of a landfill in Seattle, a daughter he had not heard from in two years. His wife had enough of him long ago, and he was blind in one eye, from when he tried to help a man crouched by the road and got beaten unconscious for his trouble. That Labrino was even operative, that he ran a decent tavern and hired live music and employed two bartenders and a cook who made good soup, testified to his grit. I said, is there anything you would like to hear, Jack? He lifted his head. Yes, that would be nice. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be such awful company. It's just the times, the times are so unfriendly. Play me something, would you, Rainy? My name is Rainier after the Western Mountain, but most people shorten it to the dominant local weather. I fetched my bass, a five-string Fender Jazz, and my tiny cube of a practice amp. Labrino was calmed by deep tones. They helped him settle. Sometimes he seemed like a man just barely at the surface with nothing to keep him afloat. But I had learned across many evenings that he was buoyed, 
by simple progressions, nothing jittery or complicated, which I wasn't skilled enough to play in any case. My teacher was a venerable red beard named Diego, who explained the ancient principle, first do no harm from early basis to Hippocrates. Lock into the beat, play the root, don't put the groove at risk. Diego said a clean bass line is barely heard yet gives to each according to their need. If I played well, then Labrino saw hillsides, moving water, his wife Eva before she got sick of him. There in the kitchen, he relaxed into himself, eyes closed, mouth slightly open, until I feared he might crumple and fall to the floor. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Rainey's five string Fender jazz bass guitar, I mean, plays a very prominent role. Um, I want to ask you about the, about music and, and being a musician, but but before that, it, it just seems to me that um, that in every one of your books that I've read, I'm just grounded. I'm grounded to the earth somehow. You know, I'm grounded by the way Ruben has to breathe through his asthma and the rhythm of Swede's epic Western poem. And um, you know, I'm 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 grounded by um, the the humming of um, Ruben's string as the kites yeah. shaped like anvils and other things that couldn't possibly fly <laughs> sail over at Lake Superior. And then, and now, um, I mean, the bass line saves people, gathers flocks of gulls, um, yeah. you know? I, and so is this conscious? Are you saying, how am I going to bring my reader down to this earth and feel feel this book? Um, it's, it really, it's not conscious. I mean, I wish it was, I, I don't, I'm not able to think of things on demand when I need them. That's part of why my books take so long to write. Um, but, but there are things, um, I think if I have a rule of writing fiction, it's that I don't write about anything I don't love. And, um, many years ago, my brother-in-law who was taking a, a church uh, he's a pastor. He's a retired pastor now, but he was taking a church not far from where Robin and I lived. And um, and he asked if I would come over and be his bass player uh, so that he can have a little band um, on Sunday mornings. Um, and I did not play bass. I played guitar badly. And um, but I was interested in bass. I've always liked a bass line. And so I, I said, sure, I'll, I'll do that if you want. And uh, but you'll have to give me some lessons. And the first lesson he gave me was, okay, here's the here's the cardinal rule: first, do no harm. What he meant by that was um, that you don't put yourself forward. You lock into the drummer, and you um, you play the root of the chord, and you play safe progressions, and you create a foundation uh, for um, for the rest of the of the tune to sort of be built upon. Um, a, a bass is something that often people don't even hear. They don't realize it's it's there, and yet it's laying a foundation. Um, that, to me, is part of the power of the bass is that you don't really hear it. You feel it in your chest. Uh, you, you feel it. If, if something goes wrong, you don't blame the bass player, um, even though it's probably his fault. Um, you just sense a disturbance in the force and you think, what is, well, the song has gone off. Um, it, it might've been the bass player. Uh, it was often me. Uh, but I, even though I never became the proficient bassist that I think Rainey is, um, I played for 15 years, most Sundays. And that gave me a kind of a working knowledge and a sort of a philosophical understanding of what a bass line can be and what it can do and how it can change the mood of a, of a tune as it moves through the air. Um, and so I, I really wanted to include that because, look, there are creation myths in which the universe is dead and cold until music moves through it. And, and then a bass line often seems to me to be coming up from the ground, up through the the clay and the soil and the substrate and, 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 and into the concrete and up into your feet and moves up into your body. That feels 
uh, like a baseline at work. And so I think that music is essentially creative and, and, um, and, and speaks to us in languages we don't understand, but nonetheless uh, need. So I really wanted to, I, I wanted him to be a bass player in the worst way. And, and then uh, some kind of cool things come from it. I mean, there's a, there's a biblical story that I really like in which, um, in which young David, and this is in the Old Testament, uh, is, is summoned by King Saul because Saul has a, a troubled mind and a troubled spirit. And he's, he's a man who's uh, at war with himself in many ways. And he, he calls for David because David can play for him on the lyre or the harp. And it settles him down. It settles him. Um, even though he's really, he kind of hates David because he understands that David is in some ways the anointed one and might be the end of him. Uh, and yet he needs him. He needs him to come and play so that he, Saul, can be at peace. And and I really wanted to, uh, I wanted, I, when I realized what was happening in the story and that there was a, a, a powerful, disturbed uh, villain, if you will, but a, a man who is, is a, a, a terrible guy who enters the story early with bad results for everyone. Um, I thought, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be something if there was a little bit of a David and Saul dynamic developing here? And then sure enough, it did. Um, it's, it's wonderful when that happens. Sure enough, yeah. it did. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> um, and just, just to play off on this, because I'm, I'm so intrigued by how you work your narrators in the um the way you you tear down the fourth wall and your narrators talk directly to us i mean there's a point where rainy says I'll, I'll have to look away soon yeah i'll have to look away and trust you'll understand he's talking to the reader because yeah. something horribly bad is about to happen and you you know your narrators say things like um you saw that coming, didn't you? Well, I didn't, yeah. I didn't, you know? So um, your narrators intrigue me. And there's a character in the book who's running a paint crew, Beezy, is it? Yeah, Beezy, and, yeah. And you, and you compare her to the drummer of a band. Like she keeps the momentum going, yeah. you know, and the pace. And to me, your narrator is your bass player. Ah, and, sure. And people like Lark are riffing off and... You know, and Supporting others are all. riffing, yeah. but the narrator is keeping the pace and we, you know, and, and it starts to hum and we just go with it. Oh, that's a lovely, I, I, I haven't thought of it that way, but I, I, I will now. Uh, yeah, terrific. I mean, um, that, that's what that's what first person narration is free to do. You know, the, the oldest stories in the world were told like we're sitting uh, face to face. And it's always, um, here's what happened. Uh, the first time that really struck me was the first time I read True Grit. And uh, and here's Maddie Ross, like the greatest narrator in American fiction. Um, just And she actually says on that first page, here is what happened. And and then tells about how, you know, her, her father was murdered by the coward Tom Chaney. And, and, uh, and then every, I mean, once she says that, you're just, you can't, you cannot look away. You cannot... Put the book down, or I couldn't. Um, still happens if I pick that book up. I'll uh, I'll be in my office. I'm supposed to be doing something else, and um, working on something of my own. And I'll pick up True Grit, and I'm just gone. I'm gone. Um, oh man, to have to have that kind of narrative power. Um, it, it, it's it's like he's waving a wand. It's just brilliant. I, I I love that. So first person is hard for me to abandon. And the one time I really did abandon it and try to do something else, I ended up throwing 400 pages away. So I don't know. Um, I, I might be stuck with that. Stick with it. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you to start. <laughs> um, and, and, and sailing. I mean, obviously, Lake Superior um, in Virgil and you know, I cheerfully refuse is, you know, perhaps the great escape on Lake Superior, but, um, you know, you must have a sense of Lake Superior weather and sailing. I mean, it, it seems to me it's like Lake Superior is a little unhappy if you just think it's a lake, you know, oh, you're not, you're not thinking of me as an inland sea. Well, here you go, you know, boom. 
um, yeah, yeah. experience with sailing and and with the weather of Lake Superior. Yeah, uh, Robin and I had a boat on Lake Superior for 15 years and spent as much of the summers as we could on that boat and and um, and so you know you can't sail that much and not get caught in some storms. Luckily, we were always near enough to um, like the Apostle Islands where we sailed out of. Uh, that we could duck behind an island and throw down the anchor and and weather it. Uh, sometimes, if we knew that there was going to be a bad blow for like three days, we would we would set out in advance and go to one of our favorite anchorages, which had just beautiful protection uh, from the northeast, which is where the bad storms always come from. And and we would just go there with plenty of groceries and just stay there and and endure the rain and the wind and just um just hang at anchor and there was there'd be this little community of 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 boats out there with their you know their lit masts bobbing at night and and um magical um magical you have to experience a storm out there if you're gonna if you're gonna sail i think um lake superior is like a it's it's like a minor deity it's a it has the same kind of power, I think, um, over the people who who live near it, as as a mountain range can have, uh, or l- like an active volcano. I mean, it it can it can be um, ruthless, and uh, yeah, the badlands of yes, exactly. Uh, it it is that way. If you're near it, and if it's in a bad mood, it does something to your insides. Um, I I, lo- I live uh, six blocks uphill from the water. And if I go up into my, my wife's quilting studio in the attic, I can look out and see it. Um, and it's, it, uh, there are just times when, when I'm not sure where to go in a story. And if I just drive down to the lake, um, and this sounds like, you know, like I'm self mythologizing or something. It's, it isn't that, um, if I go to the lake and I put up a kite and I fly a kite for a few hours, or maybe I just go down and put my hands in the water. Um, something settles and it's, it's like getting a night's sleep. Um, and, and usually the problem, the narrative trouble I'm experiencing, uh, fades away. Something occurs to me, a good idea comes and lands on my shoulder. And I I think it's a, it, it for me is a, um, a fountain, uh, of, um, I won't say inspiration because that's not really how it works for me. Um, but a fountain of like calm and um, and it takes my worries away and then I can then I can think clearly about what I'm doing Um, superiors wondrous yeah Um, I want to veer away just briefly to the topic of Minnesota writers Mm -hmm. Um, during COVID you know well we were doing sidewalk pickup we were shut down you know um, I'll speak for myself. We were scared, you know, what's going to happen. Um, and around the same time, um, we, you know, we do a lot of events and we were, I ended up reading uh, a lot of Minnesota writers and I happened to hear, um, James Taylor's song, Carolina in my mind. And, and it occurred to me that I've been spending a lot of time, Minnesota in my mind, (laughs) gone to Minnesota in my mind. I even put a song in the blogs, but um, but I was blogging about it, about Minnesota writers, including um, people like Louise Erdrich, oh, yeah. you know, uh, a children's writer named Katie Camille. Who I have tremendous she's fantastic respect for um, uh, people like Peter. Is it Guy? Peter, Peter Guy, Guy is brilliant. just a brilliant writer. He's a great um, writer. Yeah, I'm um, Tim Johnston. Tim Johnston's a terrific writer. Yeah, and and most recently, if you haven't read Marcy Rendon yet, do you know Marcy Rendon at all? You know, I've been running into that name, and I have not read her yet. Yeah, she's um she's uh, Anishinaabe Ojibwa. Yeah, and she, her her protagonist Cash Black Bear is a 19 year old Anish who lives in um, Fargo, oh. and and helps a county sheriff solve crimes. You know, really good stuff. So, um. You must know so you know some of these people. You can give us any dirt. I'm teasing. No, I, yeah, I, yeah, no, I got in a good story about a Minnesota writer. I I know a few of them. I mean, I don't know a lot of them. I I know Kent Kruger, who's terrific, and right. and, um, and whose books I I love. Uh, um, Sanford, John Sanford. Yeah, I've not met him. I've read a lot of his books though. 
He's a he's a great thriller writer. John Sanford, the Prey novels. Um, uh, Louise Louise Erdrich um, is is like a, a a patron saint of Minnesota literature. Um, I met her once on an airplane, <laughs> and that was that's the only time I've run into her. Although I've been to her store a few times, and it's it's a lovely Bir uh, Birch Bark Books, beautiful shop. Um, um, I saw Peter Guy a couple of days ago, and he wrote, um, some good friends of mine gave me a book of his called The Lighthouse Road, which is about the Eyed, the Eyed family uh, uh, that, and, that immigrated to the states and lands in Minnesota. Uh, and he has written three books about this immigrant family, and they're just terrific. Uh, look him up, Peter Guy, uh, G-E-Y-E. Um, yeah, Minnesota, I mean, we, we're everywhere. We are just all over the place. There are writers around every corner. Um, it's, it makes it kind of a, a lovely place to live. Somebody's always there to, uh, to pick you up, give you some encouragement. I was in a bookstore one night and Kate DiCamillo was there, a uh, children's author that you mentioned. She's, she's brilliant. I, I, love, uh, I love The Tale of Despero and some of her others too. But I, I talked with her and this was when I was having a very difficult time writing a second novel. Um, I was floundering and, and we, we got to talking and she said, well, you know, look, failure is the default. She said, I know that I may well fail at this, but you know what? It's not going to be because I didn't show up. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's, that's such a good way to put it. And that's such a, a kind thing for her to tell me. Um, and I, and I went back and I finished that story I was floundering around with. And, um, you know, not only because she told me that, but that was some affirmation. That was, that was just a, a smart thing to hear. And I needed to hear it. And Kate knew to say it at the time. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a community full of terrific writers. My own brother still writes novels and, and is still one of my early readers. Um, and I'm one of his, and we, we, read each other's books. We're honest about what we think. Uh, my son, John Anger, published his first novel in 2022, an adventure story called Radium. It's terrific. Right. Um, it's, it's very good. He's, he's like Charles Portis funny. Um, he's way funnier than I am. Um, and, and he wrote that novel. Um, there was a week where where I had finished Virgil Wander, John had finished Radium, Lynn had finished a book called American Gospel, and we sent them by email, and each of us read 1,200 pages that week. Uh, and and it, was, it was kind of a cool experience. Uh, there were times I couldn't tell if I'd written something or if John had or if Lynn had, and they both had a similar experience. It was, it was great. Uh, yeah, a community of writers, yeah. Well, to, to wrap up, uh, and you, you've got books to sign and all that, but um, I want to ask you about characters. I um, I read a book list review, which said your prose is beautiful to behold, which many of us, if not all of us, know to be true. Um, and readers will forgive you if Lark seems too good to be true. <laughs> And I was immediately personally offended. You know, <laughs> Leif Anger is to be forgiven for imagining exquisite characters like Lark, you know, and I was like, no, but but then it, it made me think, do you know people like this? I mean, <laughs> is, you mean Lark, like, like you know, Lark. and Lark, and throughout this book, Lark, you know, Lark is absolutely wonderful i mean um well i don't know anyone who is perfect but i don't think lark is either i mean i think i think she has her her blind spots like everybody else um i i i do think that that rainy has lark on a pretty high pedestal um and lark would be the first one to to tell him that uh but i don't think she's i don't think she's too good to be true but but you have to remember Rainey's telling the story and he's, he's uh, he, he has blind spots when it comes to her. Uh, it's tremendously fun and rewarding to write about people who are um, 
who are in love with each other. <laughs> and, and part of what I enjoyed about writing this story, which takes place in a pretty dystopian world, is that no matter how bad things get, um, characters are still going to fall for each other. They're still going to, to be a little insane on each other's behalf. I think there's, they're still going to have that person for whom there's no line they will not cross. Um, and so, um, it, you know, I mean, if, if that seems unrealistic to a, to a critic, that's okay. That's, that's how criticism works. That's all right. Uh, I was ready to find him and correct him on this topic. <laughs> but in my official capacity as forgiver of <laughs> exceptional writers, I forgive you for imagining exquisite characters. Oh, uh, you're way too kind. Thank you. Uh, uh, um, this is it's a tough it's a tough this is a tough world you've written and I and I feel like um, it's familiar somehow how this world gets tough and um, you know just more advanced and and I just want to raise this quickly there are people that that want out um and others that say, you know, um, if they want to step through the door looking for better, I won't judge them for that. But Lark says, here is better. Yeah. Stay and make this better. You know, and in other words, if we want hope, we have to create it ourselves. Does that seem like a takeaway that that you would shoot for in the novel? Oh, I mean, absolutely. Um, but also, uh, look, it's it's tempting to shrug your shoulders at at hope that seems too easily um, embraced. Um, it's I think it's easy to be a little bit glib about hope because hope can make a person too accepting, too tolerant, maybe ineffectual, not willing to go out and grab something and, and try to actively make, make the world a better place. Um, and I think what Lark would be saying there is, yeah, it's going to be, the world is tough. The world's, the world's a drag in a lot of ways. But if you stay, you can put your hands on something. You can, you can dig yourself a garden. You can, you can write a, Look, despair, despair, the trouble with it is that it doesn't do anything productive. It can be hard to escape. It can be really hard. And I have all the respect in the world for, for despair. Uh, I would never treat it lightly. But it also doesn't, doesn't help us do anything. It doesn't write any books. Um, doesn't dig any gardens. And I really wanted this book to look pretty squarely at uh, a possible bleak future, but to decide that as bad as it might get, we'll see it to the other side. I, I really want that to be a takeaway, I do. Because you know, there's also this, um, uh, the, the things can change in a hurry and change for the better. They can, we forget that sometimes. It's like. Sometimes we'd be out sailing on Lake Superior and there would be a thunderhead, I mean a storm, like heading in our direction. And you could see it coming for 12 or 15 miles away. I remember a cloud like this that we later read was 19,000 feet of, of just uh, a chimney cloud. And terrifying. Everybody's running for cover. We're a little too far out uh, to, to make the islands. And it's coming our direction. And... Uh, man, we're battening down the hatches. We're reefing the sails. And uh, battening down the hatches is a real thing. <laughs> uh, we had hatches. We battened them down. And, um, and yet that storm dissipated. It never reached us. Sometimes a storm is out there. It's real. And it doesn't reach you. Be open to that possibility, too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Just, I'm just tremendous. We're we're just tremendously grateful to have you back here with us in Milwaukee.
a complete pleasure. I love coming over here. Thank, thanks to everybody that came in. Thanks again. <laughs>